It's a difficult one when you're starting to think about ethics because most scientists are not really ethically trained. Um, uh, I think it is an important thing to broach and it's something that most of the public will be most interested in, probably. So it's a way of actually getting their, getting their interest in, in, in what you're talking about. And I think most people are slightly philosophical themselves, so they'll actually, it'll, it'll invoke discussions, which I think is a, which is a good thing. I feel it's important that researchers don't shy away from being part of those discussions around the social and ethical issues of genome editing. Um, it can be quite daunting for researchers, but actually, you know, we've all got our own viewpoints and we've all got our own thoughts about how um, genome editing might be used in the future. And similarly for the public, they've all got their own thoughts and opinions and therefore it's important to open up those discussions and have those discussions. So with the safety question, I think it's, it's important to put everything in context. So when you talk about safety of a treatment, well there are plenty of treatments that we, we know and we take for granted today that are prescribed and given to patients which have plenty of um, unwanted side effects, but they're the best treatments that we currently have. So there is somewhat an, understand an understandable concern about safety with any new technology. It's, it's a bit of a fear of the unknown, but everything really should be put in context with the relative trade-off for when is good, good enough, and at what point are you willing to accept something as being much better than what we already have. I think the sort of the issues that would immediately come to mind with any new technology would be issues to do with safety. And if you think about the potential that genome editing would seem to uh, seem to offer, you can think about you know how what those issues of safety might be. For example, if you were to use uh, genome editing in the clinic for human beings or for uh, for fetuses. And we have pretty well established um, ways of dealing with the sort of safety issues that might happen uh, around that. If you, if you think about genome editing for uh, crops in agriculture, then the safety issues become more complicated because it's not just issues of safety to the human, it's also whether these things are safe in the environment, and whether we understand the environmental risks and, and all of those sorts of things. So we have a set of discussions about, about risk. There's also a set of ethical issues that already people have uh, started to, to surface. So the Nuffield Council on Bioethics did a report asking what the conditions should be for the acceptability of editing the human germline. Um, their report I thought was really quite interesting because it didn't just say yes or no. It said there are some conditions that we should think about. So maybe this would be permissible if it didn't lead to the exacerbating of inequality, the exacerbating of the gap between the haves and the have-nots. So when thinking about um, treatment versus enhancement, for example, when uh, genome editing potential applications, so one thing that might be very desirable is to cure or eradicate a disease. However, an another thing that people might think about is perhaps um, enhancing desirable traits. However, not everything is as easy or black, as, uh, black and white because um, genomes and how we function is very complex things. So the fact that <coughs> we can edit the genome doesn't mean that we know precisely where that specific disease or desirable trait is sitting in the, in the DNA and might have several locations. So it's very complex to come to that conclusion. So the discussion about the difference between therapy and enhancement, for example, tends to also be a discussion about inequality. You know, who has access to this? We've, we've had this, I mean, this debate has been going on as long as we have known about uh, genomics, in effect, is the, the potential for the uh, separation of human nature into uh, a genetically advantaged and a genetic underclass, you know, is a is a, a much discussed theme in 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 fiction, um, and we should, I guess, appreciate what what that what that is tapping into, which is a sense that you know, people realise that technology is not just um, a, a universal benefit; that its benefits can be felt differentially, and that with any uh, benefits also come risks that need to be understood and assessed and, and managed. We already exist in a world where access to medicines isn't a, isn't a given. Um, in the UK we don't have access to all of the best new medicines um, and 
I would encourage anyone working in this area to stick within your own remit and be clear about what you are and aren't aware of. Um, and in, in our view, work towards um, a delivering a cure or a treatment for a serious condition is uh, an ethical, uh, ethically right thing to do um, and to not work in towards that would be unethical in itself. The kind of the danger and the, and the risk aspect of it is separable from the ethical problem of whether it's actually reasonable to do this or not. Uh, and I think all, even in terms of genetic disease, there's a big sliding scale. So, it, you know, if you take something like BRCA2, um, which is one of the sort of more strong genetic modifiers of, of breast cancer, um, uh, I think that the, the prevalence of that in a non-carrier is about 12% and in a carrier it's about 70%. So it's by no means a, a black and white answer. A big issue that comes with any technology is whether some people are able to benefit from it differentially from others. And we sometimes kid ourselves that technology will be universally accessible, but actually we know that rich people benefit from technology more than poor people. And so the tendency to exacerbate that gap is a, is a, a, a real concern. And it's the sort of thing that members of the public um, are worried about. Eradicating or treating a disease might be seen as a desirable goal, but then we need to engage in discussions into what is a disease. We need to define what it is a disease and where do we draw the line. So, for example, if we think about uh, attention deficit, hyper, uh, hyperactivity disorder, um, is this people that could potentially benefit from genome editing treatments in the future, or is just simply people that are different and have different needs? When people start the conversation, they pretty much exclusively start with, you know, designer babies in the in the in the in the golden term, you know, super smart, super beautiful, and and you always have to reel it back. We don't we don't understand how intelligence works. We don't understand how beauty beauty <laughs> comes into existence. We don't understand these things yet. And so, by grounding the conversation in how how basic biology works and what we do know. Um, is, is the easiest way of bringing it to that. Rather than trying to correct something like, like that and to say, oh, well, designer babies isn't, isn't what we're talking about, you know, actually, the aim should be to say, well, why, why do we think that term has, has, has entered? What does it mean to design something? What are people's concerns with design as it relates to uh, life, for example? And there's a lot behind that, and just taking the term at face value can sometimes be counterproductive. We have the technology to select embryos already with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, so we can design and we can, you know, select from a, a bunch of embryos which would be the best one. But for every case, it needs to have a specific license in order to screen that embryo for that exact genetic mutation. It's never going to be easy for, and it's not in, in the vested interest of scientists to create this perfect being um, of which there isn't. As a scientist one of the big ethical things actually is of course animal testing um, or animal research I should, say, I should say really not animal testing um, is something that we get asked about a lot and one of the big um, sort of PR elements of CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing is in theory at least we should be able to reduce the number of animals used for research and that's um, a slightly different ethical question but and one, again, that you can talk within the realms of genome editing that other members of the public find really quite interesting. Different people are going to feel different things, so it's really important that we get a full picture of what those range of issues and thoughts are from the public, and then hopefully we can make um, decisions around the use of genome editing that most people feel comfortable with and is actually the right direction that we as a society feel is morally and ethically um, right. Of course, the idealist in me wants to say this should be accessible to everybody because this is the nicest, cleanest tool that we have to date to apply all the knowledge that generations and generations of human beings have spent their lives creating. And so everyone, absolutely everybody, should have access to the, to the fruits of that labour because it, it is all of ours.